All right, welcome to Computer Science 50. This is the start of week eight, and you are about to graduate from the world of C. It's in this week that we dive into PHP and SQL and HTML and web based programming and some of the principles underlying that. Before that, a couple of announcements. One, uh, you're still tackling your last problem set in C, misspellings. Uh, note that Cato's walkthrough is today at 6 p.m. in Northwest Science B101. If again, you're not quite sure how even to begin, in this thing, that is the place to be. And the video will go online uh, by Wednesday morning. Uh, Lunch with David and other teaching fellows will be instead of this Friday, this Thursday, um, so as to. Um Make it accessible to you guys who have classes during、uh, noon and at 1 p.m. We're going to have, I'm going to eat twice that day. So, Lunch with David will be at 12 and then the sequel will be at 1. So, go ahead and RSVP as usual per the website. And if you can't normally make Fridays and you've just been dying to see what goes on at these lunches, Thursday is your opportunity.、Um, so, surveys. We'll say more on the surveys that you submitted as part of the last problem set later this week or next. But know that I have begun reading over all 330 submissions. And the teaching fellows have already read each of their submissions as they related to sections in office hours. So, a couple of quick comments. So, one, what I thought would be a novel idea of the express lane is henceforth canceled since it never really got off the ground. And we realized ultimately that it was just going to complicate what would otherwise be a, what is otherwise a fairly simple process at office hours. If you don't even know what I'm talking about, that's fine. It's because it never actually debuted. So, it, all traces of it have been removed from the course's website as though it never happened. But with respect to office hours, so this happens every year for 10, 15 years in this course that,、uh, especially later you get in the year, The more demand there is for office hours, and unfortunately, our supply is nonetheless finite. So, Jansu and the TFs have been doing as much as they can to adjust their schedules so that we can provide as much supply as possible for demand. But the TFs and I just chatted、uh, last night over email about strategies for chipping away at what remain long wait times at office hours.、Um, and the,、uh, The short of it is that part of it's up to you.、Um, so, you will see that the teaching fellows,、um, at my request, will be making much more of a concerted effort to minimize the amount of time spent per student, at least given a specific question. I've asked that we chip away at how much time we're sort of sitting there squatting next to a student, helping them from start to finish, but rather focus on getting as many of you unblocked, so to speak, as possible. And by that, I mean there's quite often some times where you're banging your head against the wall or just really can't make Forward progress because you're confused, you're not certain of something. And it's not that you need someone necessarily to hold your hand for 15 minutes, but you kind of just need to be pushed over whatever barriers in the way. And that's going to become our focus, certainly for this current problem set, so that we can not only improve our throughput at office hours, but also send the message that、uh, one of our primary jobs is to help you guys help yourselves. So if questions are coming to us via email or in person, where along the lines of,、uh, my code's not working, why? That's not good enough, right? You've been given Valgrind, you've been given GDB, you've been given Printf. You have many tools at your disposal for at least homing in on where the problem might be. And it's totally fine if you don't understand why this line of code is seg faulting. But if you can't raise your hand and already be able to tell us what line is seg faulting, well, then frankly, there is more work on your part to be done. And it's not hard, and we have provided you with those tools. So realize that we're going to push back on you guys as much as possible, but that is not to say that we will sacrifice、um, the ridiculous. Number of hours that we will continue to provide at office hours. I mean, it's, it's funny. This is one of those things where, even though we provide over 100 hours of office hours per week, you only notice when we're not there、um, or when too few of us are there. So we'll do our best, but we are going to meet that you meet us, ask that you meet us halfway.、Um, finally, the big board. Is up and live, and、uh, as the staff are inclined, myself included, to show off, we're winning.、Um, so, anyone you see in blue here on the big board is meant to be staff. And I added the blue highlighting late last night when I worried we were actually discouraging students from even beginning the problem set just to see how,、uh, how fast some people's implementations were. I'm going to sort of、uh, make the claim that it's a sign of a very good teacher when all of his teaching fellows and past students are doing better than him at the problem set. So I'm not going to touch my code. I'm just going to assume that that is not necessarily the, that, let's going to assume that that is the best I can do and just look how amazing your teaching fellows here are. And we certainly have already three students already on the big board. This is purely optional, it's purely for fun, but it's meant to just add a bit of competitive fun toward an end of driving you to be a little 
more intellectually curious. If you end up there on the big board and your time is, wow, like five minutes, 300 some odd seconds, like that's fine, because it at least means your code worked, right? So just think of that as being the compelling feature. There are certainly、um, trade offs. And I'll pick on Drew just because he, he is up there at number three and I think he can take it.、Um, clearly, you can do better than using 540 megabytes of RAM in order to implement your dictionary. But again, there's a trade off that brought him up to number three, but there's perhaps room for improvement. So, as I said in the bulletin board last night in, a post,、uh, in answer to a student, if you're up there in the tens of seconds, even in the low hundreds of seconds initially, like, that's fine. Like, honestly, you're up there, it means your code is working. Start the problem set early enough during the week so that you can engage in a bit of fun and drive yourself to implement your code even better than your first version of it. So, that's really the, the motivation there. So, what we're going to do is just mention briefly Huffman coding. So, this is about Impression, but I'd like us to really forge ahead this week and beyond on、uh, web oriented stuff. And so let me say、um, that Huffman coding is covered in more detail in this week's section notes, but I want to introduce it at least verbally as an application of yet another application of the data structures we began discussing two weeks ago and finished last week. So problem set six is all about implementing your choice of data structure or data structures toward an end of implementing a dictionary. So that alone is one application of these things. Yet another Another is the world of compression. And so for today, take,、um, take it on faith that you can use trees, binary trees specifically, to implement an algorithm. Named after one Mr. Huffman, with which to compress files. And in a nutshell, it works like this. If you have some text file, so just an ASCII file containing a whole lot of sentences and paragraphs, and each of those characters, of course, takes up one byte on disk. An interesting question, and a useful question, is can you use fewer than eight bits per character to store that whole file? Well, many files, many text files, have redundancies in them, right? The letter T is very popular. The word the is very popular. So anytime you have Redundancy and sort of a lack of true entropy, you have this ability to exploit those redundancies and somehow rip them out so as to use fewer bits to represent the same information. And so, what binary trees allow us to do, according to Mr. Huffman, is this if you've got some,、um, let's say, the script from Austin Powers, which is one of the silly text files we provide you、uh, with for problem set six, there's a whole bunch of English words and non English words in that file. So, what you can do, with, according to this algorithm, is read. Through that file and count up how many A's there are, how many B's there are, how many C's there are, dot, 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 all the way down to Z, and even the punctuation too. So you get some count for every character that's in the file. And you're going to imagine along these lines that you're going to have a lot of A's, probably a lot of T's, maybe not so many Q's. So there's going to be relative differences in the weights or the frequencies of these characters. Well, in a nutshell, what Huffman coding then has you do is begin building a tree. You create a, a forest, so to speak, of just single nodes. And each of those nodes initially, think of it as the bottom row in this tree, represents a character in that file. So you draw a node for A, a node for B, a node for C, and so forth. And then you write inside, conceptually, that node, what its frequency is as a percentage. So some value from 0.0 up to 100.0. So in this example here, that it's excerpted from last week's lecture slides, it looks like what character was the most common in whatever. Text file I counted frequencies from. So it looks like. Which one's the most frequent? I hear, do I hear, oh, do I hear E? I hear, thought I heard B, but E is the right answer, right? Because it appears to have occurred with a frequency of 45%. And then you have 20% A's, 15% D's, and 10% B's and C's. And then what you do, according to Mr. Huffman's algorithm, is iteratively combine as siblings the two smallest nodes in the tree. So the two smallest nodes initially are nodes B and C, because they only occurred with frequency 10%. So what you do is you throw into And just to be clear here, what we did a step ago was just to have this picture. So ignore everything that's up here for the moment. All I've started off by doing is drawing a forest of individual nodes. But then I find the two smallest ones, 10%, 10%. I unite them with a new parent node. And then I write inside of that parent node what the sum of their frequencies are. And henceforth, what I then do is ignore, I continue to ignore this stuff because it doesn't yet exist. I go ahead and now only consider this node and this node and this node and this node, the roots of all of these trees. And I repeat, 
I find the next smallest nodes, I combine them into new parent, and I throw that new subtree into the picture and then ignore the leaves. Then I do it again and again. And so what was originally five individual singleton nodes at the bottom become a binary tree. And if you add up, Sort of in your mind, all of these frequencies, according to this algorithm, the very top node in this whole picture ultimately is 100%, which signifies that this tree now represents 100% of the picture. And then, and this is a detail we will defer to a future algorithms class if you take one, or frankly, a Wikipedia article, which since it's not all that complicated, what you do is assume that every left child represents a 0, 0, 0, 0, and every right child represents a 1, a 1, a 1, a 1. And then you use these edges, these arrows, to figure out what sequences of bits you should use to represent each letter. So accordingly, the letter B will henceforth not be represented as 8 bits.、That That is the ASCII character known as 66, which takes eight bits to represent、uh, by convention. But instead, we're going to start at the root and go one, two, three, four. It takes me four steps to hit B, and along the way, I go down four arrows. So B henceforth will be represented with 0, 0, 0, 0. n w h i l e E, according to this logic, will be represented with what pattern? Just a one. And so, what this hints at is that for the more frequent characters in the document, you start using the fewest bits possible. And then for the less popular nodes, like B, the less popular letters,、eh, you spend a few more bits on those, thinking that they are going to happen less frequently, so you can afford to spend fewer bits. So, this is Huffman coding in a nutshell. And what the trees allow us to do is to figure out exactly what that scheme should be, what assignment of bits should be applied to each letter. So, it's sort of a helper structure. Toward that end. So, more on that in this week's section notes. But any questions from last week left over on data structures or the like? All right, so now the fun begins. One of the biggest takeaways we hope from this week, beyond giving you a crash course in PHP and HTML and a whole bunch of other things, some of which you might have seen before, some of which you might not have, is to send home a bigger message than those specifics, which is once you've taken a course like this and spent, what, eight weeks of your life dabbling in C and in Scratch and soon PHP, you should be able to, upon exiting this course, be able to bootstrap yourself to most any other language, certainly any similar language. Language. The only languages I myself ever formally learned were C and kinda sorta C, and CS50 and CS51 10 plus years ago. And that was it. Everything else I've sort of taught myself. I picked up Perl along the way. I picked up Java. I picked up、um, C in greater detail. I picked up、uh, PHP in more recent years. Because you'll find that they're all very similar. And if you understand some of the basic fundamentals, which we have been preaching again and again, it's very easy to go, well, go out and pick up new things. And One of the goals of the final project, in fact, is going to be precisely that. We've sort of given you the confidence, we've given you sort of the background with which to go dive into new material, and so be it. That's going to be your ultimate assignment there. So let's now set up the domain in which we'll be playing now with a new language entirely, but that's similar in spirit, but allows us to solve perhaps more modern problems, or at least problems that are, lend themselves to something web based. So here is the internet. Quick crash course on what the internet is. In a sentence, what is the internet? Yeah, there are a series of twos. OK, a y what is the internet really? One of the many internets. Good. Let's keep going with the internet jargon. What do you got? I know this is a bit hypocritical, right? Because all semester we sort of get away with the wise ass answers to these questions, and now we expect a little more. I heard something over here. No? Too much attention over here now? All right. What is the internet? This is kind of sad, right? Some of you are on the internet right now. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the internet, as the word inter implies, is a network of networks. So, right, there is a whole bunch of people in this world that have a personal computer or a whole bunch of servers. They've connected those computers together in, say, an office environment, a LAN, L A N, local area network. Well, those offices are generally connected to other offices, and those offices, in turn, are connected to internet service providers, ISPs. And ISPs, in turn, like AOL and Comcast and Verizon and other such players, are themselves connected to each other via what are generally known as internet back. 
backbone. So there's kind of this hierarchy with a lot of, with relatively few big fish playing in the big space with the really expensive hardware, and then smaller fish like the ISPs, like the local ISPs, and then individual users and companies. So it's a big mesh of technology. So what do you, most of you guys have in your home these days, and maybe even illegally in your dorm rooms if you don't get good wireless signals? Well, you have a PC or a laptop. That PC or laptop is connected via wire or wirelessly to one of those things called a home router or an access point or a firewall. Those things you buy for 20, 50 bucks these days do so many things. You could spend multiple weeks talking about how they work. We don't really have that luxury. Take Computer Science 143 if you'd like to learn in better detail how that kind of stuff works. But for today, we're just setting up the context here. So you plug into your home router. That home router plugs into like a cable modem or a DSL modem or here on campus into a data jack in the wall or a wireless access point on the ceiling somewhere. So every computer, though, as a result of being connected via this set of wires, gets what's called an IP address. And an IP address is like a unique identifier, uh, a number of the form 1.2.3.4 where each of those numbers can actually be from 0 to 255. But for now, it's just a number, something dot something dot something dot something. And it's that address that uniquely identifies your computer on the global internet. It's sort of the technological analog of a US postal address, which if you have the street and the number and the city and the state and the zip code and then the four-digit zip code, you can pretty precisely home in on someone's actual address. So that's the idea here. Every computer on the internet has a unique IP address, and there are these things called routers on the internet that pretty much know, based on patterns in these numbers, which computers live where. So a router, which you've probably heard of, is a big, fancy, expensive computer often that essentially has the fancy equivalent of a big Excel spreadsheet inside of it. And in one column is an IP address, or the start of an IP address, like a prefix of it. And then the right-hand column of that spreadsheet is like a direction, where it says, if you get data coming into this router and it's destined for something dot something dot dot, 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 send it out this way. But if you get something that's destined for 2.3.4 dot something, send it out this way. Because routers can have multiple network interfaces, multiple Ethernet cables coming into them, essentially, and multiple, um, multiple uplinks to the rest of the internet. So routers just route data, as the word implies, from one, direction, one place to another. So let's take a look at this. So I have SSH to uh, a Linux box here, uh, which you're probably familiar with. The astute eye will notice that even though my prompt says cs50.net, I'm faking it today, and we're on my other course's server. Uh, but I'm just uh, full disclosure, lest someone notice something like that. But we're going to run this command, nslookup. nslookup is name server lookup. And what I'm going to do here is type in cnn.com. Since I know the address cnn.com, but I've never once had to type in addresses like these, 209, uh, 157.166.226.26, and .25, and these other numbers still. Well, it turns out that some servers, or websites specifically, can have multiple IP addresses. And this can be for any number of reasons. The simplest of them just means that CNN apparently has at least four web servers. And that's probably a huge understatement. But they do have four IP addresses. So via any of these addresses can I apparently reach CNN's website. And if I go ahead and, for instance, copy this onto my clipboard, pull up a, let's say, web browser, obviously I can go to http colon slash slash cnn.com. But it turns out via these IP addresses I can also just go to the actual address and hit enter. And it seems it does, in fact, lead to the same place. And a nice little article about outgoing President George Bush. So why is that? Well, these addresses just lead to a specific computer. So why do we have um, this equivalence of CNN.com and these numbers if both apparently work? Right, if the routers need the numeric form so that they can sort of figure out mathematically which packets that come in need to go in which other direction, why bother having this second level of work where apparently you also have an equivalent name for a server, like CNN.com? Quick sanity check. It's really just common sense. There's not much engineering here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's because who wants to remember that for today's news, you have to go to http colon slash slash 
and so on, right? This is why monikers like 1-800-COLLECT exist and things like this, because it's a lot easier to remember alphabetical words than it is certainly numbers. So the same idea applies on the internet. Well, let's see now these things called routers. So there's this other command. So NSLOOKUP, just to be clear, is a command that looks up the name of an IP address or vice versa, the IP address of a name. And by name, I mean domain name, host name, fully qualified domain name. There's a lot of jargon we can throw around today, but I'll try to keep it concise and familiar. So you can convert a domain name into an IP address and vice versa with that command. Well, with another command called trace route, as the name implies, can you trace the route between points A and B? Point A here is going to be me on cs50.net. Point B is going to be, let's say, cnn.com. So let's go ahead and type trace route cnn.com n.com and what I'm going to get back hopefully line by line if this thing wants to cooperate there we go is row by row in this program's output I'm going to see mention of the specific router that lives between point A and point B so this is going a little slowly here so as this goes I'm actually going to actually let's do this uh, Malin uh, let's go to the cloud since when I tested this earlier it was a little faster there Let's go. Irony, of course. OK, there we go. Uh -huh. OK, trace route cnn.com. Much better. OK, so that saved us some time. So we see row by row here a whole bunch of cryptic looking information, some of which is a distraction, but some of which is actually kind of interesting. So it looks like CNN's IP address, at least one of them, is this thing. So already trace route resolved that for us. It then seems to be the case that the first thing between me and CNN is this thing. Well, this is actually the host name, the name of one of Amazon's EC2 servers. So they have cryptic looking names, but that's all that means. I'm somewhere inside of the cloud. But eventually I get out of that. So that eventually leads me to, let's see where. So line two leads me to some unknown IP address. Doesn't seem to have a name, so let's ignore that. I'm still within Amazon in line four, in line three, and in line four I'm still there. Then I have an unnamed server. But now it's getting a little more interesting between step six and seven. So here's six and here's seven. Where does my data seem to end up all of a sudden? It's in Washington. So it's unclear where Amazon servers are. They tell us they're actually somewhere in the Midwest. But apparently there's some kind of connection to Amazon's cluster to their ISP, which is a company called Level 3, which is a huge ISP or internet backbone in this country. And it looks like they have a few different uh, routers. They have this one here, which just based on its name seems to be in Washington. There's another in Washington, another in Washington. But then there seems to be a link between rows 9 and 10 between what two cities? So Atlanta. So my data seems to have hopped over to Atlanta. And from there, it looks like the routers stopped cooperating. So for security reasons, performance reasons, sometimes a router will just ignore you if you ask it a question like, who are you, as this program is trying to do. But we've at least gotten a sense of where the data has gone. Now, what about all these other numbers on the screen? Well, again, we're making a bit of a mess just because the font's a little big. But just let's pick on row 11. So this is row 11, the last that's actually useful. This apparently is the IP address of that router and it looks like this number of milliseconds is somehow involved. What do you think 15.946 milliseconds represents? Yeah, it's the amount of time in milliseconds that it takes for data to get from us, wherever Amazon is, let's just assume Cambridge for simplicity, all the way down to Atlanta. So that's pretty damn fast. Well, let's try something else just to sort of hammer that point home. So instead of CNN.com, let's go to CNN.co.jp. So instead of going down, let's go to the left. Let's go west. And let's see where this leads us. So we seem to have gone through some of the same routers. So that mess up at the top seems to be similarly owned by Amazon. It's taking a moment here to resolve one of them. Let's see if it cooperates. Oh, there it is. So in lines one through, oops, lines one through whatever, we seem to end up still in Amazon. So this is Amazon stuff. Then we end up at an ISP called Quest, Quest. Then we end up in something a little strange. But what's interesting is this. So look at the difference between line nine and 10. And I'll concede this, the output's a little messy, but in terms of milliseconds, what do you notice? Yeah, so somewhere between routers 9 and 11, there's kind of a huge gap. And that gap seems to persist through all of the remaining hops. In fact, this gets really slow over here. So what do you think is going on? 
Yes, ocean. Right, so one, we have the Midwest. So we seem to be jumping from two milliseconds to 72 milliseconds to get us to what I presume is LA, since、uh, routers tend to be named by convention according to airport codes. So it looks like it's taking us 70 milliseconds to get to the LA,、uh, to the city of LA. But then in line 17, TKY, take a guess? Tokyo. <laughs> well, now you participate. So yeah, Tokyo. Takes us an additional, what, almost 100 milliseconds to get there. Now, that's still pretty damn fast, right? In less than two tenths of a second, can your email, can your instant message, can whatever piece of data you've sent get from here to thousands of miles away? Like, it's amazing how fast and how well all of this stuff works, and you can actually see it. With tools like this. So, what is the internet for our purposes? Well, for our purposes moving forward, it's going to be the infrastructure on top of which we actually solve problems and we actually write code. So, the World Wide Web is a service that's offered on the internet. So, this is sort of Certainly familiar stuff to you, but the internet and the web are not the same thing per se. The internet is sort of the in physical infrastructure on top of which services like email and instant messaging and the web actually run. Now, what is HTTP, which you've probably typed quite a bit and certainly seen quite a bit? Okay, very good. Hypertext Transport Protocol. What does that mean, though? It means you can use hypertext.、Uh, give me something better. What does that mean? Okay, good. So it means you can click on links and go to other web pages. So HTTP, more formally, is the protocol or the language that a web server and a web browser speak when talking with one another. Now, what is a protocol? What is a language in this sort of hardware context? Well, it's just a set of standards, a set of rules that two computers have in advance agreed upon to communicate so that one understands the other. So, in this sense, it is kind of a language, but the language that these guys speak is very, very simple. So, just to give Give a quick example here, and I'll do it on the chalkboard so that we can leave it up. HTTP is designed to be very, very simple, and we'll see more of this in the next couple of weeks to come. But if a web browser wants to request a web page of a web server, it almost it sends just this a message like get slash index dot html. And then it specifies what version of HTTP it wants to talk. So it's a bit of a white lie to say that that's all that's sent, but that's really that all that needs to be sent from a browser to a server. So this is a protocol only insofar as the person who implemented, who wrote the browser, and the person who wrote the web server software simply decided in advance, thanks to some people coming together at a round table and discussing, yes, this is what the standard will be. The web browser sends this message, and what does the web server respond with? Well, it responds with the sequence of bytes that collectively represent this file. So, by convention,、um, most files on the web end in an extension of .html, or we'll see .php, or some file extension that denotes the language in which they're written. So, whereas HTTP is the language that web browser and server speak to intercommunicate, as this picture here suggests, HTML is the language that you're going to speak when actually implementing a web page. It's like the C code that implements a program. Program, but HTML is the markup code,、uh, special symbols and whatnot that say make this blue, make this big, that will make the aesthetics of the web page come to life. So, with that said, let's take a look at a little teaser of, in fact, how this all works. And the full version of this video is available online. How the internet works. He came with a message. He came to a world of cruel firewalls, uncaring routers, and dangers far worse than death. He's fast. He's strong. He's TCP/IP, and he's got. Your address, warriors of the net.
So this is a wonderful video that was made many years ago by folks in, uh, I think, Ericsson's Media Lab, the telephone company in Sweden. And they have a longer version of this that we've linked to on the course's website. It's wonderfully fun. The, the downside is it's not totally technically accurate, even the 10-minute version that expounds on those kinds of details. But it at least makes the internet seem pretty exciting, right? So just to tie these things together, because these are details that, for our purposes, don't really matter. But the point of today's lecture and Wednesday's lecture is really to give you a conceptual framework with which to tackle the next problem set and the next two problem sets, if not the final project. So you at least know where what you're doing fits into place. So TCP IP is the language or the protocol that any computer on the internet uses to speak to another computer on the internet. And again, some of these are simplifications for today's purposes. But this is sort of the language that involves addressing things at a very low level, putting an IP address in the to field of a, an envelope of data, putting the sender's IP address in the from field of that same envelope. So those kinds of low-level details are handled by this protocol here, TCP IP. Meanwhile, HTTP runs conceptually on top of TCP IP. So once you can assume that two computers can get any old data from point A to B, then can you begin to define what kind of data computers want to exchange from A to B. So that's why HTTP, in some sense, is on top of TCP IP. Someone went ahead and implemented the low-level details of physically getting bits from A to B. Now I'm going to spend more time specifying what those bits should now look like, why they are useful. Useful, for instance, to get web pages. On top of that, conceptually, then, will be HTML. And we'll see PHP and these other things, application layer uh, protocols or languages that assume that not only can you get bits from A to B, but two, you can get HTTP requests and responses from A to B. What's going to be in those requests and responses? Well, what's going to be in those responses, rather? Well, HTML. Well, a quick teaser then of HTML is this, and this is kind of meant to overwhelm just because much of this stuff is generated not so much by humans these days, but by computers. If I go back to CNN.com and pull up, again, Bush's popularity ratings, go to page source, it's going to open a file that contains a whole lot of stuff. So this is the HTML and the JavaScript code and the cascading style sheet code and maybe even some other stuff that collectively implement what is otherwise a pretty clean page. And it's interestingly formatted and structured. Well, all of that is the result of stuff like this. So this is the stuff that you're about to start learning today and this week and on this current problem set. And odds are your code won't be as complicated as this, certainly with not within a couple of days' time. Uh, we will see today, for instance, how to make very ugly web pages, but quickly. But can you build upon those basic skills, just like in Scratch, just like in C, to do more interesting things? So what you'll see come final project time, too, are some really fun opportunities here. You'll be able to go to a site like GoDaddy.com, and for $9.99 or something like that, can you buy your own vanity domain name, like DavidMalin.com, or a couple that we'll demonstrate today. And then you can host those domain names, as you'll soon see, on our cloud. So not only will you continue to have your command line environment, you'll also be able to create a directory inside of your cloud account, just like you've been creating PSET4, PSET5 directories, and so forth. You'll be able to create a directory called public HTML inside of which you can put HTML pages and JPEGs and GIFs and other types of files so that you can make them available on the internet. And by configuring your account in a manner that we'll explain in some problems that are the final project spec, um, by co configuring the domain name you buy to point to our cloud environment, will you be able to go to mydomainname.com? And the whole world, if they visit that address, will actually be looking at your homework or your final project on the course's uh, set of web servers. So more on that in the weeks to come. Um, you'll, see, you'll see these days, too, and this is sort of an aside, um, these things called top-level domains. Not only can you buy .coms and .nets and .orgs these days, there's a whole bunch of other ones as well, many of which are not restricted. We have, for instance, cs50.tv for the course's podcast from last year. Um, we'll talk in, uh, toward final project time, too, about these things called DNS records. So that program we ran, NSLOOKUP, that converts names to IP addresses, it doesn't just work magically. You have to sort of tell programs like that. You have to tell the whole world, in fact, what the IP address of your domain name is. And that's what you're going to do when you actually map. If you decide to map a domain name to our cloud environment, you'll essentially tell the world, hey, world, the IP address of my website is the same as that for cs50.net. Essentially, that will be the rule of thumb. So um, 
Let's see. Let's do this. I'm going to skip over this stuff because I think we'll come back to that in the context of the final project spec and dive into HTML. This is perhaps the simplest valid web page that you can make, and it is entirely underwhelming. So let me go ahead and under impress you with this. So I have gone ahead and connected to, let's say, my cloud account.、Uh, if I do an ls, I'll see directories in theory like pset4, pset5, but I need a new one today. What I Want is one called、uh, public HTML. So, one of the things you'll do for the next problem set、um, and perhaps your final project and beyond is make a directory called public HTML. Nothing seems to happen, but if I go in there, now I see nothing. But it turns out if I go ahead now and run nano with that same default file name I mentioned earlier, index.html, I just get an empty text file. And this is all a web page is. It's just a text file filled with some stuff, and that stuff is called HTML. Now, this isn't going to be quite perfect. Because I'm doing it very quickly on the fly, but any web page. Is structured with these things called tags or elements. And a tag is something that begins with an angle bracket, has a special keyword, and then a close angle bracket. And the rule of thumb in what's called XHTML, which is what we'll be teaching in the course, is that anytime you open a tag, you have to close the tag later and symmetrically. So it's very similar in spirit to just parentheses and curly braces and square brackets and stuff from C. So you have to be symmetric. So this tag here, as it's called, simply tells the world. Upon downloading this file via browser, hey, browser, I am a web page. I am written in HTML, or as we'll see, something called XHTML. Well, there's two main parts to any web page. The first is called the head, or the header, but it is just written head. And I'm going to go ahead and get ahead of too many、um, puns here.、Just、get ahead of myself and just do the open tag and the close tag, or the start tag and the end tag. There's a whole bunch of jargon surrounding this, but it's only the ideas that matter today. So we have the head of this web page, and then we have what's going to be called the body. And it's in the body where the really interesting stuff happens, the actual content of the page, but we can do things up here in the header. One of the things you can do in the header is the title. So we'll call this My Ugly Web Page, but then close title. So, notice sometimes I'm being anal and hitting enter and tabbing in to create white space, but you don't really need it in HTML. Similarly, do not really need it a lot of the time in C, but it's good style. It lends itself to readability. So, hence my indentation and, and use of white space. Now, in the body, I can do something similarly ugly. So, my ugly web page. And let's just leave it at that. I'll get rid of that white space. I'm going to go ahead and save nano and sit、uh, control X and Y and enter. And now I indeed have a file called index.html. Now I have in advance of class、uh, purchased for like $6.99, got a deal,、uh, the domain name malinrouge.com, which I, oh, <laughs> I'm not that clever. <laughs> Though it does qualify for a vanity domain.、Um, someone else came up with that for me, but I paid for it.、Um, malinrouge.com. And what I'm going to go ahead and do is go to http colon slash slash malinrouge.com. And unfortunately, I screwed up. So, there's a few steps that are useful to reinforce even at this early stage. So, this error message, you've probably seen it or things like it before on real web servers because, again, people have screwed up. Something is broken. In this case, it's a little cryptic. 403, what does that mean? Well, one of the things HTTP does is, in addition to standardizing things like get index.html version number, it also standardizes. A whole bunch of error numbers, just like C functions have. So 403 means forbidden. You don't have the ability to view it. What number are you probably even more familiar with just from using the web for years? 404 is just the HTTP error code that says file not found. The URL is bogus. You mistyped it. The file has been deleted. Anything like that means file not found. Well, forbidden probably means a permissions problem of some sort. Because now that I'm using my account not to write my own homework and submit it just for the staff, but I'm writing files that are meant to be viewed by the whole world, I need to be a little more generous with permissions. So now it becomes more important to do ls l. Because one of the things ls has been doing, if you use the Long switch in this manner all this time is in addition to telling you who you are and when you modified this file, it's also been telling you this stuff on the left hand side. So these are permission bits. And it's all very simple、um, and certainly succinct. And these are just numbers in, or bits 
as follows. So anytime you have a line of hyphens there, uh, one, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's 10 of these total. The first one is easy. It generally is a D if it's a directory. It's just nothing if it's a file. And then you'll see in the current problem set, if you ever see an L, that means it's a symbolic link. So now maybe something in this current problem set might fit in a little bit more. But then we have nine more placeholders. There's these three. There's these three, and there's these three. Okay, each of these is just a bit, essentially, a one or a zero, or we'll see apparently an R or W, but that's just the human friendly version of it. So these three bits represent an owner's permission of a file, Malin being the owner of this file. This refers to something called the user's group. So there's this notion of Unix groups where you can put all of the students in this class, not only give them usernames, but you can say, you guys are in the students group, whereas someone like me in this web server is apparently in his own van. Group, the Malin group, and that actually has useful security implications. But just know there's a distinction between you, the owner, and you, your group, which might coincidentally be named the same thing. And then there's the world or everyone else. The problem with my setup right now is that this means uh, RW, take a guess, what can the owner do to this file? Read and write it. So this is as though there's a 110 here underneath the hood. LS just beautifies it a little bit. Take a guess as to what I need to do in order to let the world see this file. All right, I probably need to put an R here or a 1 and 0, 0. I don't want the world to be able to write it or to do something else to it. And the group, by convention, will probably make the same, just because it doesn't really matter. If you're going to let the, group view,、uh, the world view your file, might as well let the group view it as well. So, in short, we want the string ultimately that LS outputs to look like this. So, there's.、Um, A few ways we can do this, and we're going to teach you the cryptic CS way.、Um, the command is chmod for change modifications, and 644 is the command that you want to do. So 644 index.html. So that's the command chmod 644 index.html. Hit enter. Now I do ls l, and voila. I've actually done what I wanted it to do. Now, why did this work? And though this may look cryptic, it's actually pretty simple. You, someone long ago, decided that because you only need three bits per person, that's a perfect opportunity for a whole new base system. So we've done binary, we've done decimal, we've done hexadecimal, now we're doing octal. So in the octal base, you have only eight possible values, zero through seven, or three total bits. If you've got three bits, You can go 0, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1, which is the value 0, or the value 7 in decimal. So, what each of these placeholders represents really is the following the read bit, which is always the first, is a 4,、uh, a write is a 2, and executability is a 1. 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1. So, when you chmod a file, you just kind of go through this list and add up the numbers you care about. So, if I want to give this file the owner the ability to read and write, well, I got to give him a 4 plus a 2, that's a 6. If I want to give the world just the ability to read it, well, I need just a 4 for that person. And same thing here, a 4 for the group. So, 644 means flip this bit and this one, this one, and this one, and that's it. But the use of octal notation just means you can represent things rather succinctly at the command line. So, what might have seemed cryptic a moment ago, and if I went too fast, might still seem cryptic, at least if you pause and rewind the video at this point,、um, should be relatively straightforward how we're using these bits and this octal notation. So, let's see if we fixed it. I'm going to go ahead and hit reload in my browser. And no. So, what else might be broken here? Directory. Okay, so not only is my file all set to go, but my file exists in a new directory. So that public HTML directory that I just created. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do ls dash, not just l, but al for all long. So dash a shows you everything in the directory, and dash l again shows you the long listing. And what's useful if you do dash a on a Linux prompt is that it shows you two things that we haven't talked about for many weeks. But you've used dot dot probably a great deal. What does the directory called dot represent? The current directory. So it's this nice little reflexive property. So, what are the permissions on the current directory? Well, what is the current directory to be clear? What are the permissions on this directory, the one I'm in? 
It looks like I am the only one who has the ability to read, write, or quote unquote execute this directory. So D just means this thing's a directory. And it turns out, in the context of directories, you don't need directories to be readable per se for the whole world to get at the contents in them. You need them to be executable. You need this last bit. To be set. And if it's not set, that's the equivalent of locking a directory. So if it's not executable, you can double click it all you want, so to speak. It's not going to open. You can type cd directory, cd directory. It's not going to let you in unless it's executable. So it turns out that the、uh, convention that you want to adhere to for Chamad is this. Directories, instead of being 644, should be 711 or 755. A distinction we'll see in time. It's not all that interesting now, but how do I do this on my directory? Well, let's see if I'm going down the right path here. Chamad 71,、uh, 755. I'll be as generous as possible. I'm going to let、um, everyone read and execute. But not write the files. They're not allowed to change it because there's no two in there. It's four plus one. Chamad dot. Enter. If I now do ls al, notice that I've indeed changed the permissions on that directory. So, cross my fingers, and there it is, my ugly web page. Now, we can do much uglier than that. Let's go back in. I'm going to start using vi because it's faster for me.、Uh, turns out that tags, elements, so to speak, in HTML, can have what are called attributes. And an attribute is something that looks like this attribute equals quote unquote value. And if you read the specification or tutorial on HTML, or more properly, XHTML, you'll see that each element in a web page comes with it zero or more attributes that browsers are supposed to understand. Now, one of the simplest is so this is just the typical form. A specific attribute that I know in advance that the body tag supports is something called BG color. All right, so BG color, background color. Well, let's do equals quote unquote, give me a color. Yellow, I heard in the back right. I'm going to go ahead and save the file, reload my page, and yes, now we're getting ugly. All right, very nice. So let's do some more. So I'm going to go inside the body now. I'm just going to make some white space so it's more clear what's going on. And there's other tags. So this, to be very clear, is not an exercise on beauty,、um, but really just on functionality. Suppose I want to center this thing. Well, it suffices, and those of you who've been doing this a while know that there are newer ways of doing this, but I'm going to keep it simple for now. To center that thing, as you would do in C or printf, you don't just do this, right? The odds are that's not going to fly, but you tell the program, center the following. Hey, browser, here comes some text you should center. And now I hit reload. And now it's centered. All right, so it's coming along. Let's、uh, go ahead and now put something on the next line. My ugly web page, my second ugly line. Problem? Those who don't know HTML, take a guess. Right, so white space is ignored, even more so than it is in C. So if you want to have a line break, you need to tell the browser, I want a line break here. And succinctly as it is, br is the line break tag. So br means break here. Let's go ahead and save that and reload. And in fact, it's, it's、uh, breaking. Let's do a bunch of these. All right, if you really want to move it down, and there are more elegant ways of doing this, but for now, just a point. Okay, so now it's getting interesting, right? It doesn't always center it per se, because if this page gets you know, shrunk, now it doesn't even fit on the page as you might expect, but at least it seems clear what's going on here. But this is a little weird. Why do you think I have the forward slash inside of this thing? Yeah, so it kind of simultaneously starts the tag and ends it, which kind of makes sense for tags that really have no notion themselves of starting and stopping. So if I just said break here, back in the days in the world of HTML, that was perfectly OK. When the world was, it's completely anarchist years ago, and you could do almost anything you wanted to and just trust that the browser is going to figure it out. But it was a pain in the neck to implement browsers that displayed pages consistently. The Same way. So, we had very early on in this world browsers like Netscape and Internet Explorer. You could have a beautiful looking web page written in HTML, but those two browsers, even if you open the web page on the same computer, would display that page differently just because the authors at Microsoft or at Netscape interpreted the specification differently. And sometimes it's ambiguous. So, when the world introduced this thing called XHTML, extensible hypertext markup language, that standardized details like Any tag that gets opened must be closed. Unfortunately, this looks a little stupid.
right? But it's consistent with the idea of a line break. Start the line break, but OK, it's done. End the line break. So this is not correct. Because really, you can't have anything in between the breaking of a line, which is why the world said, you know what, that's kind of stupid looking. Let's at least support another syntax which says you can put the forward slash inside of the start tag if you want to end it immediately. And the fact that people like me tend to put a space in here. Is really for historical reasons. Long story short, for backwards compatibility sake, which will be a huge headache over time if you really dive into web programming, sort of dealing with people with old browsers who refuse or don't know how to upgrade, this could be mistaken for a tag called br slash, which did not exist back in the day. So doing things like this at least improves the probability that a browser is not going to confuse it with a tag called br slash. Stupid things like that worth bearing in mind because this world has rather grown up organically on the web. So let's do something uh, even uglier. So let's get rid of this line and let's say I want something that's actually bigger. So I'm going to go ahead and say the h1 tag, which is the heading tag, which makes things big and bold by default. If I reload this page, it's definitely getting uglier. But now let's try to give it some sense of style. So background color, let me go to black. Unfortunately, I've just created a problem. But now you have like a secret web page where you can only see it by highlighting it. <laughs> right? Cryptography. <laughs> um, so let's be a little fancier than this. We need to now be a little more specific as to what we want. So I'm going to introduce what's called the div tag. So now in the world of XHTML1 and version 4 of HTML, the world has started making HTML a little more complicated, which is why in lecture I'll focus really on the fundamentals because you can, with a little tutorial or web page in your hand, figure out some of the more fancier techniques. But it turns out the div tag creates a division of the page. So here comes a block of text. It's like a paragraph conceptually. You can give it some style. So what style do I want to give the following division of text? Well, let's go ahead and make the color of it white. And let's say the font size is going to be really big this time. So 72 point, which I always remember being one of the biggest fonts in a word processor by default. Let's see what this does for me. OK, so it's getting bigger and uglier. Now I think we need a little bit of a logo. So let me shrink this. And this is when you know you have too much free time. I have, in advance of class, prepared this little file. Turns out it's called malinrouge.jpg. Um, I'm going to go ahead and load SecureFX, which many of you have been using already. But now that you're implementing web pages, odds are you're going to want to move files from your local computer on up to the web server, whether it's for images, music, photos, whatever. So I'm going to go ahead and connect to the server that I'm currently on. I'm then going to navigate my way to that directory, public HTML. I already had a copy of it there, but I'll upload a new one. There's my index.html file. I'm going to now go to my desktop. I'm going to find that photo or whatever it is, this JPEG. And as you're probably familiar, whether you have a Mac or PC, at least with this idea, I'm going to drag Malin Rouge, Rouge JPEG to this directory. And there it is. Now I'm going to go back here and I'm going to try to include it. So below this, I'm going to put an image uh, source. So things in HTML are very succinct, much like the world of C. What was the file called? Well, malinrouge.jpg, close quote, in image 2 has no notion of starting and stopping. So it's another one of these empty elements, so to speak, that you should end at just in the same tag as you close it. I'm going to go ahead and save this. Little sanity check, ls. Both files are there. Let's go back now to the web browser and reload. Oh. So I got a little broken icon. Why? Yeah, so again with this thing. So ls-al or dash al, notice it's got to be group readable. So chmod what for a JPEG? 644, because I want the whole world to be able to read it, to view it, to uh, see it. So let's chmod that, do another sanity check. Now it's the same as index.html, so that's good. Let's go ahead and reload. Ooh, very nice. Let's go ahead and take a two minute break. All right, we're back. So much fun stuff to do. But let's recap where we started here. So I claim that this was the simplest correct HTML page, the XHTML page that you can make. And that's true, but it's clear that I've omitted something when I was using Nano a moment ago. So the world has a whole bunch of standards. One of them is called HTML 1.0. One of them is called HTML 4.01. One of them is called XHTML 1.0. And there's a whole bunch of others. So browsers these days, uh, Internet Explorer and Firefox and other browsers still support different versions of these several languages. Now XHTML, Extensible Hypertext 
text markup language is just one of them, but it's the one that we'll expect for the course. It's perhaps the most,、uh, the cleanest of the ones out there, but we will allow you to use what's called transitional, the transitional flavor of it, if familiar. But the takeaway for today is quite simply this. It, henceforth, when you make web pages, at least for the course's problem sets and project, there is some stuff that's similar in spirit to C that you just kind of have to copy and paste at the top of your file in order for that file to be assumed valid. You need to provide the browser with a hint as to what、uh, version of the language you're writing in. So, what I really should have done in order to make the best,、uh, the simplest web page possible is let me go ahead and open up. A new file called new.html, paste in the contents of that slide, go ahead and save it. And again, if I go back here to my page and go not to you know, mailandrouge.com, which notice is the same as slash index.html. So the takeaway there is that by default, many web servers in the world assume if you don't specify a specific file name that you want something called index.html. This time I want new.html, but I think I screwed up. I did. So, I need to do ls l to check. Yep, I need to give this chmod644 of new.html. Same command, type more quickly. Go ahead and check back here. And now it is, in fact, boring, but correct. If I view source, I can go up here to page source and see exactly the same code. This time it's nicely syntax highlighted. So, who cares? Like, why did we jump through these hoops in the first place? Well, there's this notion in the world of web programming of、uh, validity. So, for a web page's source code, its XHTML markup, to be valid, it needs to adhere to certain specifications. That means you can't just make up your own tag. So, back in the day, there was this wonderful tag, and it was called the blink tag. And you put blink, and then you wrote a whole bunch of words, often a really annoying paragraph, and then close blink. So, angle bracket slash blink. And as you might imagine, what did that do? Well, it made the web page blink. Right? In a very hideous fashion. In fact, for a stroll down memory lane, I mean, you can Google things like、right, animated GIFs. We did this the other day, I think. If I go here, right, this is sort of what, let's see, arts and culture, let's see, cartoons, mangas, let's see, beauty,、yeah, Bambi. Okay, so this is what the, the web used to look like, right? There's a lot of stupid stuff going on because it was so easy to insert animated GIFs. It was so easy to make blink tags and so forth. Yes, very adorable. And now this will be your first web page, I bet.、Um, now, realize the hypocrisy. <laughs> That's a pop up.、Um, <laughs> or a, one of my bookmarks. <laughs>、um, Realize, of course, the hypocrisy here, because if you've ever visited the course's webpage while office hours in, were in session, I single handedly decided it would be nice to resurrect the blink tag, even though most every modern browser no longer supports it. But thanks to a programming language called JavaScript, which we'll start talking about next week, you'll recall perhaps that this stuff on the right hand side blinks just because we thought it would be a good idea. And yet, of course, that has come up in your surveys、uh, more than once,、um, your, your appreciation for the blink.、Um, so, what does it mean to be valid? That just means that your XHTML source code, the stuff that you typed in Nano or whatever program you use to write it, adheres to specifications that the world has decided upon. So it's like running GCC in a sense on your code. And if GCC says, whoa, invalid syntax, there's a semicolon missing, something like that, that's like your C code is not valid. Well, similarly, if your web page does not adhere to certain standards, like the head tag has to come inside of the HTML tag and the title tag has to come inside of the head tag, well, Your page too would be considered invalid. But what's wonderful about this world is that as you begin developing web pages, certainly for the course's project where we do expect validity, well, you can let a computer check the validity of your web page for you. And it will tell you as best as it can, unless your page is a complete mess, where the problem probably is. Now, there's one other piece of jargon worth introducing. And that's this notion of well formedness. So, this is, as we saw by way of example, the canonical form for an、H、XHTML element or set of tags open tag, close tag. So, you have the name of the element or the tag, and then you have an attribute equals quote unquote value. And you can actually have multiple attributes equals quote unquote values. You just separate them by spaces. So, you can have, for instance, besides this, you can have attribute 2 equals value 2, and so on. And it can wrap lines. 
lines. It's a little ugly to do so, but white space generally doesn't matter. But there is a notion of style in the world of XHTML, and that's why I've done things like indent, as I did even with my simple example here. So these are the basics now for making an, H an XHTML based web page. You have the HTML tag, the head tag, and the body tag, and then the real magic happens inside of the body tag. And there's many more things you can do just to give you a taste of this, but for the most part, um, this. Uh, your foray into XHTML will be done with a tutorial by your side because this is not sort of rocket science. Oh, and incidentally, if any of you before CS50 uh, had prior HTML savvy, HTML is not a programming language. So if your resume says you know how to program in HTML, eh, it's kind of misleading. It's a markup language, as its name itself implies, which means there's no logical structures. There's no ifs and elses and loops in HTML. It's just open tag, close tag that very explicitly tells the browser what to do. And it tells it what to do structurally, center this, stop centering this, or aesthetically, make this blue. Stop making this blue. That's what a markup language is. But you can do some interesting structural things. And again, some of you more savvy with this stuff will know that there are more sophisticated ways still to do this stuff. But there are structures like tables. So I, for instance, can do a table with a border of one. Let me go ahead and in advance close that table. Inside of a table, turns out there's a tag called tr for table row. So here comes a row in this table. Then inside of a table, you can have table data. So this will be, for instance, uh, let's say, the table, uh, a row, rather, a cell with the word student in it. And then let me go ahead and duplicate that and say that this next row here will say house. Now let's see what this looks like. So I just completely blew away my ugly web page called index.html. I'm going to go back to this web page, which again currently lives at malinrouge.com. But I'll move some of today's files over to the website. And there it is. That's actually pretty bad. Let's get rid of this. So that we can see this a little better and reload. So I have a table. It's ugly, right? This is sort of 1990s style web programming here so far. But let me go ahead now and using some nano tricks, just duplicate this a few times and fill in a couple blanks. So this will be David, and he's always in Mather when we do this. And then we have Jansu and Elliot. Now I'm going to save it. And just again to paint the picture of what we're doing here is by adhering to this structure, everything that's opened, so to speak, is closed symmetrically. Every piece of data is actually between tags, not inside of tags. Can we do some interesting things? Um, we can change the attribute here to be zero for the border, get rid of the border. So you can kind of do structural things as well. So tables, even though. Um, the religiously devout will say, don't use tables when it comes to laying out a web page, because clearly you can lay stuff out with a table, and yet you can make the table invisible. This is perhaps one of the simplest ways to lay out a web page if you want to do interesting structural things, and it's one approach we'll preach in the next problem set, because it's simple. But there's many more sophisticated ways if you really start to like this stuff. In fact, the way to start making pages really fancy these days is by way of a technology or a language called CSS, Cascading Style Sheets. And you saw me use this. When I used the style attribute a moment ago and I said font size equals 72 and uh, color uh, colon whatever I chose for the color, well, that was an instance of CSS, cascading style sheets. And this too will refer you in the next problem set to an online reference for sort of a cheat sheet of what you can do and how. But with CSS, can you exercise more fine grained control? over a web page's appearance. And by that I mean this. So back in the day, and I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this now. Well, let's save that for later. Let me go ahead and open up, um, say, 2.html, or we'll call it CSS.html. Let me quickly whip up, copy index, CSS. OK, prefabbed web page. So let me quickly demonstrate how things used to be done to make clear what CSS uh, is motivated by. So back in the day, if you wanted to say something like in the center of the page, hello world, you would say hello world. All right, so that's all there was to it. If you wanted to make it bigger, you can use the heading tag. But back in the day, there was font size equals quote unquote six. And then down here, you would, of course, close the font tag. And then just to be anal, I'll indent this. So this is CSS.html. And I'm going quickly just because of the boring steps. But I've just chmodded it correctly. And now let's go back to CSS.html. So this was index. CSS.html looks like this. So that's font size 6. Well, what's font size 1? Well, that's this. 
But those font sizes would look completely different in different browsers. Because what does it mean to be font size six? Like, whose bright idea was that? Well, back in the day, things were all relative. So font size one just meant small. Font size six meant bigger. Font size seven mean, meant even bigger. But there was no standardization. So CSS is in part about being much more specific. And so what you can do, for instance, are things like this. I'm going to copy my own example. But again, we'll defer some more of this to section time. I'm going to go ahead and change now what I have in this file. I'm going to go ahead and paste in this very example. And draw your attention to this. So, this is again, hello world. But notice I've kind of left room up in the head tag. So, it turns out that inside of the head tag, you can put more than just the title. There's a few tags like style that you can put up there that are not attributes but actual elements. The type of the style that I want to tell the browser to use is the text slash CSS type, something you copy and paste for now. The comments are here. So, this is an HTML comment. No one will see this. Is a comment in HTML, but the reason it's commented out is also for legacy purposes. This is so that if someone with a really old browser, like Netscape 1.0, tries to visit your page, it's not going to choke on the following stuff just because it's never seen it before. If it's in a comment, it will get ignored. So you'll learn little tricks like that if you like this stuff over time. But with CSS, can you actually control the aesthetics of the page en masse? You can make changes to multiple elements at once in one central place. For instance, I can In one place, specify, you know what? The body tag should have the following properties. The background color should be, let's say,、uh, yellow. And I can say that、uh, border should be 20、uh, pixels that are, let's say, black. Remember hex codes from the last problem set? Promised it would come back with a solid line. And that's it. So I've said that the body tag should take on these attributes. And unless I've screwed up and done something the browser shouldn't support, if I go ahead and reload css.html, in fact, that's what I've gotten. Kind of. So, you would think that the body, and this is again, you'll learn by example, and welcome to the world of web programming. You would think that the body of this page. Is the body of the page. But that's not necessarily the case because different browsers will render this page differently. In fact, I've not done this before, but let's just take a look. So, this is Google Chrome, which is very similar to Safari. It renders similarly. Here's IE7. It renders about the same. What you'll find is, thankfully, these three all look the same. You, oh, do they? No. So, even here, we're being really anal now, but think of this magnified in other contexts. Here's Internet Explorer, and here is Safari. Do you notice a subtle difference? OK, a y there is the scroll bar, but there's something else. <laughs> so there's more space at the top. Like it's subtle, right? But there's more yellow above the black bar right now than there is now. More, less. More, less. Right? You might think this is silly, but when you're trying to design a page, even the course's web page, where you actually care about precision and it looking right, having the site, having there be like a yellow border around the page or a white border because the graphic isn't hugging the top of the page gets really annoying. And so these are the kinds of things that for CS50 we don't care about, to be clear. It's not an exercise in aesthetics. Office hours are in progress now? That's a little strange. Peter. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I've got competition. All right. <laughs> so that's where everybody is, right?、Um, so. This is again just a hint at some of the things you'll trip over. And this is not where the emphasis of the course can be. You can take any other, you can take a course on like how to make web pages if you want. We care more about the fundamentals here. So, really, I'm introducing these things just so that you don't bang your head against the wall wondering, like, why is my code wrong? It's perhaps the result of these things called cross browser issues. So, there's a whole bunch of browsers these days, Chrome being one of the newest ones.、Um, what's really neat if you begin to like this stuff, and you probably will come final project time, because if you, like some of last year's students, Make a website that you actually want students to use, sort of in the spirit of something like Shuttleboy, a program where you hope one more than just you will actually find it useful. You probably would take some pride in the aesthetics of it. And so, websites like browsershots.org is really useful because if you go there sometime, you'll see that they allow you to see your web page. In、uh, any number of different browsers. They'll create a screenshot for you so that you yourself don't have to have a PC and a Mac and a Linux box in front of your computer, which frankly is precisely how I developed the course's website so that it looks the same across three different browsers. For CS50, though, we will just ask that you tell us what browser you want us to use to look at your work, and we'll take it from there. So, 
That was the aesthetics. That was your crash course in HTML. And if you're thinking, whoa,、uh, maybe we didn't really learn HTML there or XHTML. So I myself learned XHTML from my Math 20 CA in the basement of the Science Center in about a 45 minute period of time after math section one day, which is only to say that this is the kind of stuff that if you now understand the idea of chmoding files and making them publicly accessible, and the idea of opening a tag and closing a tag, and the idea of attributes and values, well, now you just Turn your attention to like an XHTML tutorial that tells you what other tags exist besides the TD tag and the body tag and the center tag, and you just start making more complicated things. And you learn by example. I mean, early on, I would very frequently go to the view menu of a browser, view source, and even though pages are getting a little complicated these days, if you're careful and you poke around the code, you can learn by way of other people's pages as to how to make something happen. How, for instance, in the course's web page, did we? Implement this notion of like three different columns, right? So there's some interesting structural things that, again, are not obvious on first glance. But we have something that's over here, and then we have this thing that's in the middle of the page, and then we have this column on the right-hand side with office hours. So you can do more sophisticated things, and that's where, again,、uh, tutorials and other people's sites can be useful. But now let's turn our attention to the programmatic. So I'm going to assume from now. That if brief, that was enough to at least paint the picture of how you make a web page. Doesn't do anything, and it's really ugly, but at least it provides us with a framework now to write some actual code. So one of the ironically simplest websites on the internet today is still Google. You go to their homepage, and you pretty much only see this: an HTML, an XHTML. Form. So, what is a form? Well, a form is anything you filled out that has text boxes, has radio buttons, has select menus, and has some kind of submit button. Usually, well, it turns out that Google's website, at least their homepage, is pretty darn simple. In fact, they take great pride in this.、Uh, if I go ahead and view source here, oh, and incidentally, another common gotcha when learning this stuff: if I open up this page in IE and then I go to view source. Notice it opens it up in TextPad, so you might laugh, but、uh, a noob mistake is to start changing your web page in Notepad accidentally. Hit Save, go back and reload, and wonder why it's not changing. Well, it's not changing because the web page lives on the server. What you were looking at is a copy. So realize that. It lives on the server. When you hit reload, it's going to reload it from the server. You can do anything you want to the Notepad copy that's been loaded on your client, but it's not going to have any effect. But let's go ahead and look at what's inside of Google source code. It's a bit of a mess, so I'm going to go ahead and open it real quickly in a really fancy HTML editor, WordPad. So this is Google's homepage, and it looks like a mess. But why do you think it's so darn compact? Right, there's no white space. Even though I just preach the virtues of white space, either I'm wrong or it's possible. What's that? So it loads faster, sure, right? It's just unnecessary bytes. So white space useful for humans, useful for TFs. When it's a computer reading the stuff, who really cares? And if you're serving up billions of web pages a day, and you're paying for bandwidth, and you're paying for electricity, and you're paying for servers, it's amazing how much saving one byte, magnified by billions of requests per day, will save in time and in money, quite literally. So what companies like Google have done is they've compressed their pages, which makes them, unfortunately, Harder for us to sort of understand and learn from because they're so sort of clouded by lack of white space. But the computer doesn't care, right? The computer can just parse this,、uh, can interpret it a little more carefully. But what I'm going to go ahead and do is、uh, use a little trick called Control F, and I'm going to search for a tag called Open Bracket Form. So a form tag, which we've not seen before, seems to be giving me this stuff. So I'm going to highlight a whole bunch of it. Let me see if I can find the end of the form. I can't do it by eye, so let me search for、uh, forward slash form. That's there. Okay, so here it is. Despite all of the other messiness there, this is what Google has made billions of dollars on. Okay, that represents this text box or this search box. All right, it's that. So this. Could have been you, right? Had you written this code a little while ago? So what's going on inside of here? Well, we've got a form tag that says, "Hey browser, here comes a form." A form has again inputs and buttons and stuff like this. Well, what's in here? Well, there's a lot of distraction, but it looks like Google is actually using an invisible table. So by default, apparently border is zero if you don't specify it. And in fact, Google's even cutting corners here. So Google's not using XHTML. XHTML, if we, as I've preached today, does require quotes, whether double or single. 
around attributes. But again, Google sort of leveraging the fact that there's so many browsers out there that are a little tolerant even of mistakes and things like this. Let's save on all of our quote marks because it saves us money. We, though, don't need to worry so much about the finances of the cloud. So notice what they're doing. They have some kind of table, which is apparently laying things out in memory,、uh, laying things out on the page. But let's get to the interesting stuff. Let me go ahead and get rid of anything aesthetic. The table is just fluffy aesthetics. So there's something interesting. Input name equals HL, type equals Hidden. What's this? Input autocomplete off max length is 2048 title. So that's interesting. Here's a BR tag written in the old style. So let me just separate these out. All right, here is this.、Uh, here is this. Let's get rid of the fluffy aesthetics. We don't need a font tag. We don't need a link for advanced search. That's it. I'm just going to get rid of this. So that is pretty much Google's form. So let's try this actually. Let me go back here and let me go back into、uh, copy index. I'm going to call it google.html. I'm going to chmod it 644. I'm going to go in with nano. Actually, let me use pico for a second. And I'm just going to make some room for this thing. And I'm going to paste in the stuff that I just copied from Google. I'm not going to worry about aesthetics and indentation for now. I just want to get the job done. So that's what I've borrowed from them. So let's take a look. MailinRouge.com, Google.html. Ooh, very nice. I have my own little Google page there. All right, so what does this do? So apparently, this is action. So the form tag has an action attribute, and that says, Where do you want to send the results of this web page when you click submit? Well, this is.、Um, Slash search. This implies now a relative path on my own web server, and there is no search program on mailinrouge.com at the moment. So, you know what? Let me actually go back and say, you know what? It's actually on Google server. Okay, so that's okay. So now go there. I'm going to leave the names the same. I'm going to make this a little uglier, perhaps. Let's see, h1、uh, fake Google. How about? Let's put some line breaks in there. Just again, we're doing quick and dirty sloppiness here. Okay, fake Google. Not bad. Now, let's see, inputs. I'd like these buttons on the next line just so, ooh, now it really looks like Google. And in fact, if, racing the clock here for something stupid, but it might be worth it. If you want to go to the lectures link and go down to today's lecture, and you can go to the Google logo maker and you can do fake Google.、Okay. Such, a, such a waste of time. Okay. <laughs> Save image as, save it to my desktop, fake dot, what was it, a GIF? GIF. Okay, now let's, let's this is important. All right. <laughs> Upload this to the server. Ch you can chmod in SecureFX if you get the properties of the file, incidentally. Okay, that's,、uh, don't need that, don't need that anymore. Got it, got it. All right, let's see. We got our permissions right, good. Let's replace this ugly thing with, okay, what's the tag for an image? Quick. Image source equals, was it fake.gif? Okay, close that tag. Where's the damn webpage? Oh, there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, unless you think we've accomplished nothing today, let's go ahead and search for, for instance, computer science 50 on my fake Google, and you'll see <gasps> it works. <laughs> see you Wednesday.